I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, reproductive efficiency. Now, maybe to start with, what do I mean by good reproductive efficiency, or what do we want from, cow, from a cow herd from a reproductive standpoint? A few of the key things that I want is I want a high percentage of cows pregnant in a controlled breeding season. And more specifically, I want the herd to be front end loaded. And that's a term that, that we often use just to mean that a majority of the cows are going to calve in the first 21 days very early in the calving season. We also want good reproductive performance year after year. In other words, I'm a, a big fan of a concept called positive momentum. And it's because I believe that really good reproductive success this year helps ensure good reproductive success next year. So if that's what we want, what are the constraints? Well, the cows give us or kind of deal us a hand that we have to deal with. One is that whenever a fertile cow ovulates a fertile egg and she's mated by a fertile bull, we don't always get a calf from that mating. In fact, about two thirds of the time or between 60 and 70% of the time, when a fertile cow is mated by a fertile bull, she will actually conceive and take that uh, fetus all the way to calving. Now, what that means is that many times she will go ahead and conceive but lose that pregnancy within the first 10 to 14 days. And if she loses that pregnancy within the first 14 days, she'll just recycle and come back into heat about 21 days after her last heat cycle and, and you really won't notice anything other than she's back into heat. And she'll have another, say, 65% chance to get pregnant again. Another constraint that we have with beef cattle is there's a period of infertility after she calves. That period of infertility lasts around 60 days for cows that are in good body condition. Now, one of the things, whenever we use the word average or typical, it's important to remember that that means that about half of the cows are going to have a longer period of postpartum infertility than 50 days or 60 days. And so if you think, kind of think about the, the bell-shaped curve where 55 or 50 to 60 days would be right in the middle, you've got some cows that are a fair amount shorter than that in how long she's going to be infertile and a, another group that's a fair amount longer than that. Oftentimes when I think about a group of cows, my goal is for something like a number that would predict when 90% of the cows are going to resume fertile cycles. And basically you can add about 20 days to whatever the herd average is to capture 90% of the cows. So for many herds, about a 75 day, or yeah, about a 75 to 85 day period of infertility is what I expect to take until 90% of the cows have resumed fertile cycles. Now, this is a study that was done at uh, the Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska, that looks at each of those dots is the a cow and on the left side over here you can see how long she was infertile and it ranges from about the lowest the dot that's at the lowest is about 20 days and the highest is about 120 days so one way to interpret that is cows could be as short as a 20 day postpartum infertility and as long as 120 days the bottom axis is the julian date and basically january 1 would be day one and about the oh, the, the beginning of uh, March would be around day 50. And at the, maybe the end of May would be day 150. So if we look at this group of cows from the Meat Animal Research Center up in the central Nebraska, and if you were to start calving about March 1 and calve for 60 days, that red box really captures all of those cows that kind of calved in that time frame, And you will see that on average, it takes about 60 days, but they'll range anywhere from 30 to 90 days of a postpartum period of infertility. Now, another thing that we learned from this study was time of the year does matter. And cows that calve a little bit earlier in the year, when daylight is a little bit shorter, tend to have a little bit longer period of infertility. So if we move this up to, to cows that are going to calve, say, in February and first part of March, that period of infertility might be a little bit longer, maybe averaging 70 days or so. And if we calve a little bit later, maybe starting towards April, then the period of infertility might be a little bit shorter. So there is an effect of day length on how long that cow stays infertile after calving. Now, 
Another constraint that we have to deal with is not only is that period of infertility about 60 days for cows that are in good body condition, our first calf heifers tend to have or are more likely to have a little bit longer period of infertility, maybe 80 to 100 days infertility. And so again, if you add another 20 days in order to get 90% of first calf heifers, I need at least 120 days after calving to assure that a high percentage of those heifers have resumed fertile cycles. And if you start doing some math and you remember that the year is 365 days long and pregnancy lasts 283 days, there's about an 80 day gap in between those two and my period of infertility for heifers is really bumping up and is passing uh, that length of time that I have to get them rebred. All right, so those are a couple of important constraints that are kind of hurting us or that we have to deal with as we aim for good reproductive efficiency. So if you kind of pull out the calendar and look at what that's really telling you, cows that calve at least 40 to 50 days before the start of the breeding season, in other words, they calved in the first 30 to 40 days of the calving season, those cows are very likely to have resumed fertile cycles by the 21st day of the breeding season, and they would have three opportunities in a 60-day in a 60-day breeding season to become pregnant. Now, why that's important? If each time that she has an opportunity to be bred by a fertile bull, she has a 65% chance of settling and then carrying that calf to term. If she's got three opportunities, so 65% chance followed by another 65% chance, followed by another 65% chance, basically about 95% of the time, those cows will become pregnant in a 60 to 63 day calving season or breeding season. Now, if, calves, if cows calve later in the calving season, say more than 40 days from the start of the calving season, they might resume fertile cycles by that 21st day, but more than likely they're gonna be resuming their first cycle in the second or later 21 day period of the breeding season. And therefore in a controlled 60 to 65 day breeding season, she's only going to have two opportunities to become pregnant during that time. And so now instead of having three opportunities, if she only has two opportunities to get pregnant, we expect about 88% of those types of cows to conceive during the, the breeding season. So these are some of the constraints that we have and we know what we want. So the best we can really expect year after year in a beef cow herd is a pattern of, of pregnancy, something like what you're seeing on the screen. In other words, so in the first 21 days, if all the cows have resumed fertile cycles and the bulls are fertile, I'm aiming for, and my goal is to have about 65% of those cows become pregnant in the first 21 days. Then remember those cows are still fertile. They just didn't happen to maintain that pregnancy first through those first critical divisions. And now she has another two thirds or 65% chance of getting pregnant in the next 21 days which would be about 23% of the herd. And then finally, she has that third chance to get pregnant. About 7% of the herd will get pregnant in the third 21 days. And that leaves my 5% open or my 95% probability of getting pregnant in three opportunities at each time having basically a 65% chance. Now, a couple of things we already talked about. Remember, those cows that calve in the first 30 to 40 days of the calving season are the most likely to have resumed fertile cycles by the 21st day of the next breeding season. Well, to maintain this pattern then, that length of postpartum infertility needs to be right around what our prediction is, right around 60 days. If it's extended because the cows are thin, then I start running out of days and cows have fewer opportunities to get pregnant in the subsequent breeding season. So one of my main goals when I'm trying to maintain good reproductive success in a herd is to make sure that those cows enter the calving season and the breeding season in good body condition, not really to shorten the postpartum interval, but to maintain it so that it doesn't get longer than I want it to be, all right? And then the final thing, and we've started to touch on this, those first calf heifers are oftentimes a little bit of a challenge. They're still growing, they're suckling their first calf, and they tend to have a risk of a little bit longer period of infertility after that first calf than they will at subsequent calves. 
So because of that, I really need my first my heifers to calve very early or even ahead of the mature cows. All right, so this is what I want. I would like a herd to have this type of a breed up pattern, but I will admit a lot of herds fail to have this type of a pattern. How bad could that be? Now, for a commercial herd, we're selling pounds at weaning. And so I like to use a spreadsheet just to do the math to evaluate, well, what do, what is the pound impact of having calves that are born a little bit later? So I'm gonna compare a good herd compared to my ideal herd. So this is not a poor herd reproductively. This would be a good herd. So maybe 52% become pregnant in the first 21 days of breeding, 25% in the second 21 days, 15% in the third, and we still only have 8% open. So if you 92% breed up is considered pretty good in most herds. So let's do a little bit of math, and that's what a spreadsheet is really good at doing. So my desired herd is there on the, on the right with 65% pregnant in the first 21 days, 23 in the second, 7% in the third, and then 5% open in this herd. If I compare that to another herd that's, again, pretty good, but not quite up to my really desired goal, where 55% of the cows get pregnant in the first 21 days, 24% in the second 21 days, maybe 13% in the third 21 days, and we end up with 8% of the cows open. So what that ends up looking like in a herd with 300 cows that begins, uh, begins calving April 1st and is going to wean their calves November 1st, and let's say they average about 2.2 2 or 2 and a quarter pounds a day, and we're selling these calves for $150 a hundred weight at weaning with a $14 price slide because we know those lighter calves do gain a little bit more at, uh, at sale on a per pound basis, even though they are lighter. Now, when you put all of that into the spreadsheet to do the math, what you find is that with my ideal herd versus a good herd, we have about 4.6% more weaning weight and about 4% more weaned calf value, which is about $29 more per cow exposed, or for this 300 head herd, that's about $8,600 additional income from the weight of those slightly older calves. Now, one of the points that I like to make to commercial producers when we look at these types of charts is the cost side of these two herds would be identical. Um, you know, my winter feed bill's the same, my bull breeding costs are the same, everything else is the same on the cost side, but my ideal herd generates about $8,600 more income from the same level of inputs. Now, that's kind of a beginning to look at why I think reproductive efficiency is so important, but I compared my ideal herd to a pretty good herd. The reality is, it is really common for only about 50% of the cows from a herd to be cycling by the 21st day of the subsequent breeding season. And so if that happens, if only 50% of the cows have a fertile cycle during the first 21 days, and we get two thirds of those pregnant, we end up with about 32% of the herd becoming pregnant in the first 21 days. Now, in a herd like this, cows will resume cycling as the as the breeding season progresses and the, and the calving season gets farther in the past, so that maybe 20% become pregnant in the second 21 days, 14 in the third. But because not all the cows were cycling by the 21st day, we probably can't cut this breeding season off after just 65 days. So we're gonna to need to take it a little bit longer. So we'll go into the fourth 21 days and possibly even part of the fifth 21 days in order to have a good breed up. So in this herd, we ended up with 90, 3% of the cows pregnant, so only 7% open, which again, as a percent of the cows that breed up, it's pretty good. But instead of doing that breeding season over three 21-day periods, we've extended that to almost five 21-day periods. So what this might look like in this histogram or bar chart is 32% of the herd calves in the first 20 days, another 20% calves in the next 21 days, 14 in the third 21 days. And, and so you've got this longer, flatter calving season where the, the calves are spread out over more days. And so those later born calves are going to be weaned off at a lighter weight 
and a younger age. Now, a couple of things that I like to point out, and it's because, and this is why I've kind of grabbed this term momentum. Last year's calving distribution has a lot to do with next year's calving distribution. Remember I said that those cows that calve in the first 40 days, so those first two 21 day periods, are the most likely cows. Most of those cows should be cycling by the 21st day next year. Well, in this situation, it's about 50% of the herd is expected to be calving early enough so that they're cycling by the 21st day. And that's exactly the scenario that started this pattern, and it's probably going to be a very similar pattern next year. So momentum tends to keep the calving pattern or the breed up pattern very similar from one year to the next. All right, so what does this mean from an economic standpoint, from the amount of weight of calves that we're gonna sell at weaning on a commercial herd? Well, again, I've got my desired scenario, 65% pregnant in the first 21 days, 23, seven with 5% open. And I compare that to this longer calving season where more cows are giving birth later in the calving season. And what we find is that if I can get my front end loaded, my cows to calve early in that calving season, those calves are older and heavier at weaning, so that they make about, that they weigh about 12.6% more weaning weight, about 10% more weaned calf value. And for this 300 head herd, that's about $64 per cow or almost, well, a little bit over $19,000. And again, my emphasis is, in my opinion, the cost structure for these two herds is basically identical, but the income side is almost $20,000 different. All right, one other thing that I like to really emphasize when you have a front end loaded herd is by having most of my calves born early, it makes the herd a little more resilient when bad things happen because all herds have to deal with the fact that a, a, a bull can go bad. We can have some weather challenges. We can have drought issues, those types of things. But because I'm most confident in my bull fertility and the cow health and well-being at the beginning of the breeding season, by having most of my cows bred up in the first 21 days, it really kind of protects them for things that might happen later, in, later on in the breeding season. All right, so we've been mostly talking about the mature cow herd, but I've kind of been mentioning some issues about the first calf heifer or that first pregnancy and first calving. And so let's talk about heifer fertility and its importance on maintaining and, and establishing this good reproductive momentum. So again, the constraints are the fact that pregnancy in the beef cow lasts about 283 days and we have 600 and, or 600, 365 days in a year. So you take 365 minus 283, we have 82 days after a cow calves for her to return to fertile cycles in order for her to calve at the same time she did last year. Now, in cows, remember, that would be where I'd expect about 90% of my cows to meet that goal. But first calf heifers may have more trouble meeting that goal. In that first calf, or that postpartum, post-calving infertility for first calf heifers, oftentimes is 80 to 100 days. Uh, and so therefore, I really need those heifers to calve at the very least, right at the beginning of the calving season. And my preference is for those, calve, for those heifers to calve ahead of the cows so that they have time to be cycling with fertile cycles by the 21st day of the subsequent breeding season. All right, is this easy? Is it easy to get heifers to reach puberty and get pregnant early enough so that they could calve a few weeks ahead of the cows? Well, the average age at puberty for North American beef cows is, is somewhere between 11 and a half and 14 months of age. And that's a pretty big age range. And so it's important for veterinarians to really make sure and evaluate the heifers to make sure that each individual heifer and the group as a whole has, has a good opportunity to reach puberty in time to get bred a little bit ahead of the cows. So the onset of puberty is determined by several factors, but the two biggest factors are age and weight and breed is another factor. The average age at which these Bostaras, basically beef type animals, uh, reach puberty is again, that 10 to 14 months of age with 
But that's, again, that's average. Back to my middle of the bell-shaped curve, that means half of the heifers are going to be a little bit longer than whatever average is. So in order to figure out what I need to have, say, 90% of a group of heifers, add 30 to 40 days onto the average for the cohort to, to get my 90%. So in this case, if I want and expect my heifers to reach puberty by 365 days of age, 12 months of age, then that 90th percentile means that at the very least, they need to be as a group 13 months of age or, or, or more, all right? So my expectation is that 90% of many heifer groups will reach puberty by 13 months of age. So that kind of becomes my goal. Now I agree that some herds have earlier puberty, which makes breeding the heifers ahead of the cows a little bit easier. Some herds have later puberty, which is going to be a challenge then to get them to be bred ahead of the cows. And genetics and nutrition are two factors that can influence this age of puberty of the, of the herd or the group. All right, now again, Onset of puberty is mainly determined by age and weight. So let's think about age. Again, if you kind of fi figure out when cal heifer calves were born, if they were born in the first 42 days, first two 21 day calving periods, they are the most likely to reach that 13 months of age by the time I want to breed them a little bit ahead of the cows. So how much will they have to weigh to, to reach puberty? Well, this is where we start talking about the term target weight. And you hear a number of different target weights or percentages thrown around, such as 50% of the mature cow herd weight, 55%, maybe even up to 65% of mature cow weight. And, and those are all interesting parts of the question. But the real question is, what ration should I feed the heifers so that the desired number of heifers reach puberty in time to be bred a little bit ahead of the cows? So I do need to know a target weight at the time of puberty, therefore I, so that I can develop the rations so that they reach that target weight by the target breeding date. Now, rather than relying on these percentages of mature weight, what I'd really like to do is have the records for a herd over several years that really shows me, well, at a certain weight, a majority of heifers in this herd have reached puberty. That gives me a nice, exact target versus just a percentage of their mature weight. Now, let's talk a little bit about why there's a little bit of argument of a, over what percentage of mature weight is a best target. Now let's use an example of if a mature cow herd averages 1,200 pounds and heifers truly reach puberty at 55% of mature weight, then here's my bell-shaped curve. What we would find is that if I set my goal at 50% of the mature cow weight, there are some heifers that will reach puberty by that weight. Maybe 24% or so of the cohort will reach puberty at that light weight. By definition, if I set my goal at the 50th percentile, then about half of the heifers should reach weight when I expect them to reach puberty as a percentage of their mature weight. What a lot of people do though, is they want more than half of the heifer group to have reached puberty by the start of the heifer breeding season. So they might aim for 60% of mature cow weight or even 65% of the mature cow weight. And again, each of these is kind of a different way of asking the question. So when I work with a, a cow calf producer, rather than picking a target weight for that producer, I want to know what is their goal? If their goal is they have a group of heifers, and they would like a high, high percentage of those heifers to reach puberty before the start of the breeding season, well then my advice would be to set a high target weight or a high percentage of the mature cow weight so that a high percentage of those heifers will reach puberty. Now, other producers say, I would like to put a little bit of selection pressure on those heifers so that I would like to select heifers that reach puberty at a little bit younger age, lighter weight, and by doing that, my recommendation might be to set a lower target weight. Maybe, again, if I knew what the actual herd puberty um, goal would be, I could use that. Or maybe I could use 55% of mature cow weight as a way to put some selection pressure on that group. Now, I wanna warn people, if you put selection pressure on heifers so that fewer of them reach puberty, then fewer of them will reach puberty. 
and you won't have as good a breed up, but the heifers that did conceive did reach puberty at a lighter weight. All right, so because beef heifers can reach puberty by our target breeding date, but it can be a little bit close, particularly with different genetics and different nutrition. Therefore, as a veterinarian, I like to use this three-point scale where I classify heifers as either ready, intermediate, or a problem. Now, my ready heifers would be kind of what you would expect. They have a body condition score over five, probably closer to six. They are 55 to 60 percent of their 65 percent of their mature weight, and I palpate their reproductive tract, and I find that the reproductive tract is fairly mature, and I can find some CLs or large follicles. Um, an intermediate heifer would be a heifer that really I don't detect any problems, so she's in a good body condition. She's nearing her target weight, but I, when I palpate her uterus and ovaries, they don't feel quite as mature, so she's intermediate. Now, a problem heifer is a heifer that has a problem in any of these areas of critique, such as she's a little bit thin, she's a little bit low in body weight, maybe she's got a small pelvic area, and a very immature reproductive tract. So, putting it all together, a lot of times, if we've got a group of heifers, all the ready heifers in that cohort are basically, they're ready for the breeding season, no matter when it starts. Intermediate heifers, it kind of depends on when I evaluated them relative to the start of the breeding season. Sometimes we will do this heifer evaluation right at the time we're going to institute a synchronization protocol. And if that's the case, then the, the beef producer and I need to have a conversation. Those intermediate heifers might respond to our synchronization protocol, but I don't expect them to breed up as well as my ready heifers. So sometimes we do go ahead and synchronize those heifers and include them in the AI group, or sometimes we will immediately put them with the bull. Um, occasionally, we will evaluate these heifers maybe six weeks ahead of the breeding season. And an intermediate heifer six weeks ahead of the breeding season actually has a pretty good chance of reaching puberty by the start of the breeding. We may bump up her nutrition a little bit to make sure that she reaches puberty in time for the breeding season. And so again, this is a, the intermediate heifers are the ones that I, the veterinarian and producer really need to talk about and decide what's the best way to use those heifers for their herd. Um, and then finally, problem heifers are probably heifers that aren't a great bet to be a good replacement heifer. And we tend to manage those as feeder heifers and just uh, go ahead and move them out of the reproductive pool. All right, I've, I've emphasized that I really think that momentum is important, meaning that good reproductive performance this year helps to ensure that we have good reproductive performance next year. So as a veterinarian, I'm really interested in, well, what can harm or kill momentum? Well, heifers that don't, have, that don't calve ahead of cows, particularly heifers that calve a little bit late in that calving season, because of their long in period of infertility after they calve, they are very unlikely to resume cycles within the first 21 days and may struggle to resume cycles within the first 42 days. So I really like my heifers to calve a little bit ahead of the cows. I, I especially want to make sure those first calf heifers are in good body condition going into their calving and breeding season so that they don't have a prolonged period of infertility. The same is true for cows, maybe not quite as sensitive as heifers, but I also want the cows to calve in good body condition so that that period of infertility is, is right around where my prediction is, which is around 60 days or so. And I can't, even though I really haven't emphasized bulls in this conversation, uh, nothing will kill reproductive efficiency faster than a bull that isn't fertile. So we need to make sure that we've done breeding soundness exams. If you're using artificial insemination, that you've got good semen and good uh, insemination technique. Basically, I need to make sure that the bulls uphold their side of the, the mating bargain. All right, so those are the things that kill momentum. And, oh, I almost forgot. And of course, as a veterinarian, uh, abortion-causing diseases. So this goes back to the, the vaccination protocol, the biosecurity we have for a herd to help protect them from abortion-causing diseases. So these are the the issues that I want to really assure are all in good shape so that we can have good momentum, good reproductive efficiency from one year to the next. There we go. Great presentation, Dr. Larson.
So we've had some questions submitted by our audience. Good. So we will do our best to get through as many questions as we can in the time that we're given. However, there's no guarantee that we'll make it to every single question. However, if your question is not answered during this webinar, we will pass it along to, doc to Dr. Larson so that he can get back to you through email correspondence. All right. So the first question is, if a cow or a heifer comes back into heat 15 to 25 days after calving, is it okay to breed them or should we wait for the subsequent cycle after okay. that? That's a good question. That's early, but occasionally we do see cows that come into heat that quickly after calving. In general, many times that first estrus um, has, a, has a, sh a short cycle, is what we would call it, and so the fertility may be less. There's really no harm in uh, uh, exposing that cow to a bull, um, but probably we're not going to reach that two-thirds chance of actually conceiving and settling. It's going to be some number less than that. But no real harm from exposing her to the bull, um, but probably not going to have quite the reproductive success as if she's a little bit farther postpartum. Okay, excellent. And are there any uh, minerals that can affect heifer fertility? Um, yes, but it's very geographically um, specific. In other words, uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to do work with some nutritionists, and we've done some trace mineral work, and what you find is because trace minerals are basically, um, well, minerals, are associated with the soil and the plants in a region, it's very hard to make blanket recommendations. So my, my blanket recommendation is to have a good nutrition program that meets energy needs, protein needs, and the mineral needs for your area, um, but what works in one area would not necessarily be appropriate for another area. Excellent. And changing directions a little bit from heifers, as far as donor cows, is there any special maintenance that you recommend for those donor cows? Hmm. Um, yes, and, yes and no. Can I answer it that way? Uh, of basically, it's, it's, they require just good animal husbandry. So again, I go back to really good nutrition, keep them in a moderate body condition, uh, not too heavy, not too thin, and just you know a really good environment so that, um, that, that we minimize stress, we really minimize the health risk to those cows. So really nothing different than what I'd expect for all cows, although sometimes they get a little bit of extra attention. Okay, excellent. And then as far as phenotypes that you may observe, are there any phenotypes that producers can be looking out for that are correlated to fertility? Oh. Um, the, the one that we're a little bit, that we are aware of is um, scrotal circumference as an indication of age at puberty. So, so I, and I should say scrotal circumference of yearling bulls. So a young bull that reaches a large scrotal circumference relatively early in life will tend to have daughters that also reach puberty early in life. So that's probably our most direct phenotypic measure of some of the fertility aspects. As, as you know, uh, fertility is not highly heritable. It's not zero, so there is a heritable component, but it's not highly heritable, and we don't have very many really clear phenotypic clues to fertility. A lot of times we just have to expose those cows to a bull and the ones that get pregnant quickest and easiest, they're the most fertile. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that, so the ones that get pregnant early, that's a phenotypic uh, clue that she's fertile. Of course. And um, how soon after calving is it ideal to start that timed AI program in a herd? Okay, um, and, and you might get some different answers from different people, so you get my answer on this one. I really prefer my cows to be 40 days postpartum when we start the sync protocol, which basically means, if you kind of think about my front end loaded herds, those cows that calved relatively early in the first 20, you know, the first two 21 day periods, they're the ones that are most likely to then be ready to breed um, at a, a synchronization right at the start of the next breeding season. Um, now, there are people that will say, well, some of those later calving cows, our sync protocols will jump start some of those, and that is absolutely true. But but it's a lesser percentage. The, the more recently she's calved, the lesser percentage of those cows that will be successfully jump started. So my best success are gonna be those cows that are at least 40 days postpartum when we initiate our synchronization protocol. Okay. 
Um, and I guess you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but how can we speed up a late calving cow to help her catch ah. up with the rest of her herd mates? Um, I have tried many things <laughs> to, to speed up a cow, and, and it, it, there's a few things we know. We do know that the synchronization protocols that use a progestogen will jumpstart some cows and shorten that postpartum period. One of the things that I tell vet students all the time is you, you can't fool mother nature, at best you can nudge her a little bit. And this is one of those examples where um, I think I can reduce that period of infertility by 10 days, maybe two weeks on a lot of cows, but I can't, I can't, I can't shove her way earlier than she's going to be naturally. And, and so our postpartum or our progesterone based synchronization protocols are probably one of our better tools. We've done some work where you'll do a short term, say 48 hour wean of the calves. So basically pull the calves off for 48 hours right at the time, basically. So if you were using a cedar type protocol, right when you pull the cedars and start her through the, to the timed insemination, just keep the calf off of her during that time frame. you'll actually kind of help jumpstart a few more of those uh, cows to resume fertile cycles. In my experience, that has worked a little bit. It, it, you can count the number of cows that it does improve, but that's a lot of work for a little bit of benefit. Um, but then the other thing is, again, over-conditioned cows, so really high body condition, won't really speed up uh, when she resumes fertile cycles, but if she's thin, that can really slow it down. So I guess my answer to this question is monitor body condition, keep her in moderate to good body condition, use the progestogen type uh, synchronization protocols, that'll jumpstart a few. And if you really wanna do a little bit of extra work or a lot of extra work <laughs> for a little bit of gain, you can do a, a, a wean of the calves between the time that you pull the cedars and you time AI the cows and then you put the calves back with them. That'll pick up a few more. Perfect. Although I'm not sure anyone's a fan of extra um, work on the farm. I, I've done it a few times and I can count that it does work, but I'm not real eager to implement it very often. Excellent. And in those synchronization protocols, as you're bringing more cows into heat earlier, do we need to increase that bull to cow ratio mm -hmm. in the herd? This is actually one of the problems that, that I've struggled with. Um, I've worked with a lot of herds where by good heifer development, good um, cow management, we can have really good success to a timed AI protocol but you don't get them all pregnant. So then, then you have a pretty tight group of either heifers or cows coming back into heat about 21 days after your timed AI. And a lot of times when we look closely at our, our subsequent bull breed up, we're, we're below my target. So we might get 65% of the cows pregnant to my timed AI and then far below 60% with the bull. And I, I think we're just really pushing because um, obviously the females are in good shape so my answer is yes but the number of bulls i would probably need to make sure that i get a good breed up is painfully too high mm -hmm. so at, at, i'm frustrated because i would like to solve this problem um, so it so for instance if we're using if we're talking about a group of heifers and typically we'll say, we'll put yearling bulls with about 15 heifers, um, but for a cleanup bull, maybe double that. Okay. And that's starting to be a lot of bulls. And so you start to really have to weigh the pros and cons for how you're gonna manage, not just the AI synchronization, but the, the following 21 days and how we're gonna manage that. So it, it takes a fair number of bulls. Okay. And I suppose between spring calving herds and fall calving herds, are there any significant differences between the two that would lead to opting for one breeding season mm. over the other? Um, I've had the opportunity to work with producers that have been fall calvers or spring calvers and even a few that do both. And I think the key is to make it fit the operation. And, and there's going to be, again, some geographic differences just based on <laughs> forage types. But kind of in this central part of the United States where I've spent most of my life, um, a couple of things I like about my fall calving herds is a lot of times it's relatively easy to have them in good body condition going into the calving and breeding season. They've just come through, you know, a pretty good grazing season and, and it's really fairly easy to get them into good body condition going into calving. However, 
then my, um, my, my forage quality heading into breeding may not be as good unless I've got some, um, some annual, annual forages or something to put them on. So long story, I guess. Basically, I've seen producers successfully do both fall and spring calving. I think it just really needs to, to fit you. Although maybe the one thing I will say is the fall calving herds that I've seen that had the most success had some sort of, and again, so in our part of the country, um, annual grasses, uh, wheat pasture, rye grass, something like that, that really allowed them to have a green growing forage during that breeding season, you know, which is you know, right in the middle of winter. It's a little bit harder to do if you're trying to breed cows on dormant forage. Um, and again, in other geographic areas, they, they have green growing forage right during that fall breeding period, and it's not as much of a problem. Um, and as you know, labor is kind of on everyone's mind on a farm or ranch. So do synchronization protocols really help to shorten that breeding season? They certainly can. What, um, one of the reasons that I emphasize momentum is I think that some of the, the synchronization protocols can be a great tool. But really, if you kind of look at my charts and if you read between the lines what I'm saying, is herds that already have good reproductive efficiency are gonna benefit the most from a synchronization protocol. And, and they will actually have an opportunity to, for even more front end loading. If you've kind of got one of those longer, more extended calving seasons, because so many of those calves are born in that, or cows are gonna calve in that third, fourth, fifth, 21 days, those cows are not good candidates for my synchronization protocol. So if I already have kind of a, a prolonged calving season, synchronization protocol really won't fix that. Okay. It's, it, to use a, a term that people use sometimes, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So herds that have good reproductive patterns and good reproductive efficiency, they benefit from this technology. Herds that don't, this isn't where I would start. I would first start to try to get more cows calving early before I add the cost and labor of a synchronization protocol. So I don't know if I really answered that question. I'm gonna come back around to, um, does it reduce? So maybe, maybe my answer is no, in that if you've got a long calving season, it won't shorten it. Mm -hmm. If you already have a short ca calving season, it helps keep it short. Okay. So that's my answer. Excellent. All right, well, I think that concludes all of our questions. So on behalf of all of us here at the American Angus Association, I would like to thank you for joining us in our Angus University webinar this evening. Now, for all of you joining us, um, after we finish, the browser will redirect you to a survey. We appreciate any feedback or suggestions for future topics of educational events such as this one. Additionally, the full recording of tonight's webinar will be available on Angus University, Angus TV, our YouTube channel, and as, well, and as well it will be emailed to you directly. So once again, thank you Dr. Larson for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, and everyone please have a good night.